I am so glad that we serve a living Savior, that we today have a living hope, and that what we talk about today is the thing the world needs the most, and that is hope. Right now, our world is struggling to find hope. There are so many divisions. There are so many wars. There are so many things that are happening in our world to tear us apart. And yet, the Bible tells us there is hope, and that hope is found in the Prince of Peace. He says, I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he has said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it well, more abundantly. This is what he offers. And so today, when we think of the resurrection, it fills our hearts with that assurance. Jesus said, because I live, you who believe in me, you too shall live. And that is a promise from Almighty God, the God who cannot lie. And he went to that cross paying a penalty he did not deserve to pay. But he did it because he loved us. That crown jewel verse of the Bible that says, For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life, not temporary life. And some people say, well, I don't understand the cross. It's because you don't understand the power of sin. Sin is something that is so destructive and it is so malevolent that it cannot stand in the presence of a holy and just God. It has to be dealt with, and we couldn't deal with it. It was beyond our abilities. And so God sent his son, and his son took care of the sin penalty that we might have that ability to stand before a holy and righteous God and to be declared righteous. That is an exciting thing. Well, today, on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, I want to talk about seven truths of Easter. So if you've got your pens and pencils and notepads or ever how you want to write these down, I'm going to give you seven this morning. They're going to loosely follow the, the phrases of Jesus on the cross those seven last phrases, and they're found in various places throughout the New Testament in the Gospels. And so we want to look at those this morning because today we want to understand a little more of the depth of the message of the cross. And so today, the number one truth that I want us to look at is found in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. So if you have your electronic device, your Bible. There's a, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you if you don't have one. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23 and verse 34, Jesus is now led out of the city. He is placed on this wooden cross and these huge spikes are driven through his wrist and his feet. And he is lifted up, dropped into a deep hole with a thud. And he is there and he is suffering and he is going through the last acts of redemption on this earth. And notice what he says. After he is hung up and all the crowd is there to stare and gawk, he says these words in a prayer to his father. He says, Father, what? Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them. You know, forgiveness is one of the most powerful forces in the world. And if there's one thing that people look for, long for, need, is that sense of being forgiven. That sense that that which is wrong is made right. When their inner world is out of balance and they know there's something more, something missing, something they need and something they long for. And what that is, it is to be at one with their creator, to be at peace 
with the one who is called the Prince of Peace. And so this is why Christ died on the cross, that you and I might have total forgiveness. Total, not partial, total. My sin, past, present, future, all under the blood of Jesus Christ. That is what I need. I need to know that I am forgiven, that I am right with God. You see, I cannot forgive myself until I know that I have been forgiven by my Creator. When I know that my God has forgiven me, then I have the power to forgive myself, to receive that forgiveness, and to walk in a freedom I would never had before. And so he says, as he looks upon the crowd, those who are jeering, those who are mocking, those who had spit upon him, those who had plucked his beard, those who had whipped him with a cat of nine tails, a whipping that many men died under. As he hung on that cross with his body going through wave after wave of shock, his thought was, as he looked out upon them and saw all of the pain in their lives, as he, he could name each one by name and he could tell each one of them, filled with hatred, bitterness, pain, suffering, the revenge, all of the ugliness was there. It was being hurled at him, and yet he says, Father, forgive them. You see, the cross is about forgiveness. Christ came, and all of my sin, all of it, was placed on him. It was put on him as he hung on that cross. God judicially transferred all of my sin, rolled it over onto him. Why did he do that? Because God saw I couldn't handle it. God saw I couldn't pay for it. God saw that I was not able to carry that load, that that load was crushing and condemning. But when it was put on Christ, hmm, he was able to bear the sin of all the world. And the courts of heaven saw it. And when he had paid that penalty, the Bible says the court of heaven declared that a way had been made available for us to have that judicial penalty of condemnation removed. Hey, folks, it's great to walk without condemnation hanging on you. I... Over the years, I've done a lot of counseling, and I will tell you that one of the most caustic emotions that I have seen in people's lives is the emotion of guilt. It just eats away at the very fabric of their soul. It is like an acid that just slowly eats away. Guilt is something that God did not design you to carry. God designed you to be free from that, and he made a way where you can be free. When the condemnation is lifted, I love Romans 8, 1. The Bible says there is therefore now no, what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Some people think that our God is a revengeful, ugly God, a God who is out to get us. But folks, nothing could be further from the truth. God is not a vengeful God. God says to each one of us, I am for you. I am not against you. And we know that. And if you've ever wondered whether or not God loves you, <coughs> then take one look at the cross. And when you see the cross, you should have that question forever answered. God is for me, not against me. So total forgiveness. The message of the cross, totally forgive, means to remove all the guilt. To remove all the guilt. All right, well then, there's more. There's more. What's the second truth from the cross? Well, the second truth from the cross is... 
immediate paradise. Now you remember, as you look in the scripture at Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, just down a little ways from where you are right now, notice what it says. As they were uh, all gathered around and Jesus was on the middle cross between two thieves. And you remember the one thief blasphemed him. The one thief made fun of him. The one thief said sarcastically, if you are who you claim to be, why don't you save yourself and us? That was not a call of faith. That was a call of sarcasm, a call of mockery. If you are who you say you are. And today there's a lot of people who just cannot believe that he is who he said he was. He said that he was the son of God, that he had come from God, and that he had come for a purpose. And that was an eternal purpose, and that was to rescue mankind from its own sin and to bring them hope and to bring them forgiveness and to bring them the majesty of heaven to come. He came for that purpose. But many people just, no, that's fairy tale stuff. But there was one on the other side. He rebuked the other thief. He said, man, don't you understand what you're doing? We are justly condemned. This man has done nothing worthy of condemnation. You see, what he was doing was he was first admitting that he was, what, a sinner. He said, we are justly condemned. Hmm. You know, the Bible says that before anyone can have a relationship with God, they must know that they need God. And the only way you're going to know that you need God is when you realize you've got a sin problem. And so... This man realized he had a problem. And he knew that he was soon going to die. And he, in faith, he turns to Christ. And he says to Christ, Lord, and remember, nobody can call Jesus Lord except the Spirit of God move on his heart to call him that. He says, Lord, remember what? Me when you come into your kingdom. He recognized that Jesus was a king and that he was establishing a kingdom. Now, he was not a theologian, but he got a hold of just a kernel of truth. Some people say, well, I don't understand it all, so therefore I can't receive. I don't know enough to get saved. I don't know enough. But the Bible never says you had to know it all. The Bible says you just have to understand God loves you. Christ died for you. And he says, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. And when a person says, Jesus, I come. In faith, the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice because one has come home. One has come back from the death to the life. And so here we see this one, this one person turning to Jesus, this thief on the cross, and he says to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Two words, remember me. It's so simple that a child can get a hold of it. Two words, remember me me. I wonder if somebody this morning needs to, needs to say those two words. Maybe in your heart, you're, you're feeling, oh my, I need, I need, I need. Then turn to the crown jewel of heaven, Jesus Christ, and say, remember me. There has never been anyone who uttered a cry for help, but what heaven didn't respond. Remember me. 
And so there was an immediate response. Well, what was that immediate response? Jesus turned to him and he looked at him. And with eyes of love, he put the words of eternal hope into this man's soul. He said to him, today. Don't you love that word? Today. 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 You will be with me in where? Paradise. Paradise. He didn't say after a long period of time. He didn't say after you've gone to a place and paid penance for all of your sins. He didn't say any of that. Today, you will be with me in paradise. I love that. Immediately when we leave this body, sudden death, sudden glory. Sudden death, sudden glory. I've been talking with several people this week who have had experiences where they were clinically um, at a point where they could be called dead. They were brought back. But I can remember talking to several and over 46 years of ministry experience and visiting a lot of people in the hospitals, you hear a lot of stories. And it's been amazing, the similarities. There are unique differences, but there are so many similarities of people who, when this body shuts down, there is that sense of leaving, leaving, going into the presence of God. Jesus said, friend, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now either Jesus was a liar or a lunatic or he was who he claimed to be. Nobody in their right mind is going to say that kind of nonsense unless it's true. And he gave this man hope. Now he said paradise. Why? Because up till this time, and you know this, we've talked about this, but up till this time, all departed souls went where? To a place called Hades or Sheol. Hades is the Greek word. Sheol is the Hebrew word. It's the place of the dead. As we've said before, it was divided into two parts. One part was called paradise or Abraham's bosom. There was a great gulf between the two. And on the other side was a place of torment and flame. And we find this in Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus and the story that Jesus told there is a perfect Example of what we're talking about. That day when Jesus died and the thief on the cross whose faith was in him when he died, together they went to paradise, to the side of Sheol or Hades that was a place of blessing. And the Old Testament saints had been there and had been waiting for their day of redemption. You see, they had faith in one who was to come. And they were in this place waiting for the day when they could be set free to enter into the total promises of God in a place called the New Jerusalem. We sometimes generically refer to it as heaven. And so that day Jesus went with the thief. They went into the place where the saints were gathered and Jesus, the scripture says, made a bold announcement. He says, it is done, folks. It's finished. You are free. And he says, I'm going to take you on a journey. And he says, we're going to ascend to my father's house. Hmm. We're going to ascend. And so all of the saints, the newest arrival, the thief on the cross, he wasn't there long. And then when Jesus, the Bible says, when he led captivity captive, they had been captive in a wonderful place, but he led that captive group into heaven and presented them as trophies of grace before the Father's throne in the new Jerusalem. It was a marvelous day. As he was getting ready to take all of them up, he said, I first got to stop in Jerusalem. And he did stop. 
He said, I've got to meet some people. One of those people that met him after his resurrection was Mary. And when she saw him and recognized him, the Bible says she what? She went and fell at his feet, grabbed his feet, and was holding on to him, worshiping him. And he says, Mary, you're going to have to let go of me. I've got a trip to make. But he says, when I get done with heaven's business, I'm going to come back. So you go ahead and tell my disciples to meet me in the upper room. They know where I'm going to meet them. Just tell them I'm coming back. I'm going to meet them. But right now I've got a, another little trip I've got to make. So you got to let go. <laughs> she didn't want to let go. She lost him once. She wasn't going to lose him a second time. But he said, I'm coming back. I'll be back. And so he did. He took captivity captive. And some of the recent saints who had been recently deceased, the Bible says in Jerusalem, they came out of their graves and they walked around. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Here's your loved one knocking on your door saying, I'm back. Kind of a shock. What do you think they talked about? I'm sure he talked about the power of the resurrection and the glories that they were going to experience. You see, God allowed them to come back because the scripture talks about Jesus being the first fruits of many brethren. And so this was the little first fruits wave offering. If you go back in the Old Testament, you'll see this is what the priest did. He would take the first fruit of the harvest and present it to God in anticipation of a great harvest to come. These folks who came out of the graves during the time Jesus came out, they were part of that little wave offering, that first fruits offering. And they were the promise of a resurrection to come. Jesus promised that there would come a day when the dead would hear his voice and all those that are in the graves shall come forth. How many of you believe there is a resurrection day coming? Do you believe that? That is our hope. Yes, there is a resurrection day. But until the day when our bodies are resurrected and transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Paul says, that we are what? <laughs> we are absent from the body, but where are we? Present with the Lord. Where's the Lord? He's in the New Jerusalem or heaven, as we say. Wow. Think about that. So on that first Sunday morning, resurrection morning, Monday morning, uh, Sunday morning, just think about all the things that were happening. Just think about all the things that were going on. So much took place. More than just the resurrection, but so much more. So he says to the thief on the cross, Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. But what he didn't know was three days later, he would be with Jesus in the new Jerusalem. Wow, it's getting exciting, folks. You see, God wants us to know these things. Why does he want us to know these things? Because it is to be a hope. When you stand beside that casket, when you stand beside that hole in the ground. You are not standing there, sitting there, hopeless. Paul said we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. We have a hope. That hope occurred 2,000 years ago when an angel rolled back the stone, not to let Jesus out, but so the disciples could come in and see that he who said, I am the resurrection and the life, death could not hold him. Jesus took the crown. Jesus took the keys of death and hell. Jesus said, I'm alive forevermore, and he that believeth in me shall live forever. Do you believe this? And so number three, the third statement we find from the cross, it's in Matthew 27, 46. If you want to turn there, Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Ila, Ila, lama sabachthani. Aramaic translation, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Mm. Why have you forsaken me? Well, the third truth is this, and we're going to get into it, but the third truth is never forsaken. Never forsaken. For some people, this is a difficult verse to understand. But it's actually very easy to understand. Once it's explained, Hebrews 13, 5, for he himself has said, I will never leave you. I will never what? Forsake you. Now, where was this said? Well, God said that to Moses. And he said, tell this to the children of Israel. He also said this to Joshua after Moses had died. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. David put it this way in, in the Psalms. In Psalm 37, 25, David said, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Now let me remind you that we are righteous by grace and grace alone. So why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God forsook Jesus on the cross so that he would never have to forsake you. You see, when Jesus was covered up with our sin, all the filth, all the pain, all the darkness of sin, all the ugliness of sin, whatever sin you could name, whatever blackness you could call it, when it was all placed on him, the Bible says in that moment when my sin and yours was transferred to him, God, who is holy and just and pure and righteous, could not, could not look upon that. Could not. You see, some people think, well, God's just going to let everybody into heaven. He's going to sweep all of our wrong under the rug. It doesn't matter. It does matter. And he can't sweep it under the rug. His own righteous law declares that it must be dealt with. And that's why Christ agreed to be the one who would deal with it. And he said, let me be the substitute. Let me take their place. And the Father said, all of this will be upon you and I'll have to turn away from you. You see, Jesus never in eternity passed had ever known a moment of time where he was not one with the Father, where he was not in the Father's presence. I think this frightened Jesus, if I could say that word, more than anything else he would endure, was the fact that he had never known sin, and for the first time, sin would be felt by this righteous soul, and he would experience the Father turning away something he had never known, something he had never experienced. And in that moment when it occurred, it is as though his humanity just cries out, oh, why have you forsaken? His deity understood the why. His humanity felt alone and forsaken. Why did God turn his back on his son that day? So that he would never have to turn his back on you or me. Never forsaken. Never forsaken. This shows us that salvation is by grace, not works. Because if it were by works, then you could do something to get God to reject you. But you can't do anything to get God to reject you. If you put your faith in Christ, He will never leave you. He will never reject you. And that's the truth of resurrection morning. Now, the fourth point of the seven is constant care. In John 19, 26 through 27, we're going to see something very human, very touching. Because as Jesus was on the cross, his mother Mary 
was at the foot of the cross. She never left. I cannot imagine the agony of soul as she was watching what was happening to this little one that she carried in swaddling clothes. I cannot imagine the pain as she thought back on all the things this curly-haired little boy did when he was young, growing up, and all the memories that came flooding over her soul as only a mom can experience. Watching her son die so cruelly. Tears, broken heart. And Jesus says something to the Apostle John who was standing there as well. John was the one apostle who did not run away in fear. And in that moment, he transfers responsibility. You see, it is believed by church historians and from everything we can understand that Joseph, who was Mary's husband, that he had died at some point before Jesus began his public ministry because we never, we never hear of Joseph being mentioned in the public account of Jesus' ministry. He died somewhere back there. And somebody said, well, why did God allow that to happen? Why did God allow Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, to die? You know, I think, if I could just surmise and speculate, is that Jesus was exposed to all the pain you and I are exposed to. He knows what it's like to lose a loved one. He knows what it feels like to have someone taken out of your home by way of death. He knows the feeling of loss and sorrow and brokenness and sadness that occurs with that. He understands that. You see, the Bible says that from that day forward, because Jesus commissions John to take care of his mother, and the Bible says from that day forward, Mary went to the, live with John. And she lived with John all the days of her life, and she lived a long life and a fruitful life until she died. That would not be the case if Joseph was still alive. And so he is concerned about the things that concern us. Folks, God does not waste one drop of your pain he understands it, he feels it, and he is there to meet that need. He met the need of Mary, his mother, through John. God will meet your needs. Call upon him. When your heart breaks, you say, does he care? Does he really care? Does he feel what I feel? Then go with me to the tomb of Lazarus. See him standing outside the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus. And the Bible says, the shortest verse in the English Bible is this, Jesus wept. Does he care? Oh, yes, he cares. He hates what sin has done to his creation. And so, for you, for me, there is constant care constant care he is with us he cares about everything that concerns us there is no concern you have that he is not aware of it there's a fifth truth about easter if you would like to write these down this is the truth about full atonement now what does this mean this is going to be an interesting verse verse john 19:28. it says after this Jesus knowing that all things were not accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said this, I thirst. Now, sometime we look at this and we say, well, what does that have to do with the atonement? Now, the word atonement, let me just break it down, three syllables. You know, you could say at one meant. If we change the word meant to with, atonement means to be at one with. Atonement means God has made it possible for you to be at one with 
him. So what does that have to do with I thirst? Well, you will remember that when Jesus was in the garden, he prayed, Father, if it be your will, let this what? Cup be taken from me. But then when they came to arrest him, and you remember Peter pulls out a sword and chops off the ear of the high priest servant, which Jesus, by the way, stuck back on, healed, told him to put up his sword. He says, do you not know that I must drink this cup? Drink this cup. So he had come to the point of knowing and understanding that it was the Father's will that he drink this cup. And so how do we interpret this? You see, when he hung on the cross, he said, I thirst. Now, prior to this, they had tried to give him something to drink. And he what? He refused it. But yet he says after that, I thirst. Could it be that what he was talking about was a thirst for something else? Just a thought. Was he physically thirsty? Oh, you better believe it. This kind of torture, this kind of shock of the body, yeah, there would have been an immediate thirst. Loss of blood, yes. There would have been a horrific thirst physically. But could it also be that he's talking about the cup that the Father gave him? Maybe he was saying when he said, I thirst, he said, I am ready. I'm ready to drink this cup. I'm ready to grab hold of all of the sin and jump into death. I'm ready to drink the cup. You see, later, just before he gave up his spirit, someone took and put sour vinegar on a sponge and held it up to him, and he did take that. I believe that sour vinegar that he took off the sponge represented sin. And he took that sin, and the Bible says immediately after he took that sin, that sour vinegar, he said what? It is finished. Tetelestai. Tetelestai. It is finished. So, could it be that the cup of I'm thirsty was the cup of I'm ready to make this full atonement for sin? Number six, number six, the sixth truth of Resurrection Sunday is that it's completely finished, completely finished. I love this because he said it is finished. Now, folks, if Jesus says it is finished, John 19, 30. If he says it is finished, then let me ask you, is it what? Is it finished? Is it finished? Come on, is it finished? Yes. So why are you trying to add to it? Well, I, you know, preacher, I got to just, you know, keep the golden rule and, I, you know, just try to do unto others and I've got to, you know, do the best I can and... And, and I just got to hope I make it to heaven and do all these good. Listen, that's nonsense. Because you can't do enough. The message of Christianity is not D.O. like every other religion in the world. The message of Christianity is D-O-N-E. It, the whole gamut of man's salvation, it is finished. The ledger that held all of your debts was stamped paid in full. Paid in full. You stand before a holy God with your sin debt paid in full. It is completely finished. Hebrews 4.3 says the works were finished from the foundation of the world. 
Revelation 13, 8 says the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Well, how can it be from before the foundation of the world? And yet here at this moment in time, it is finished. And that's because God is eternal. He lives outside of time. But he came into time in the form of a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And in time, our time, he completed all what had already been completed before the foundation of the world. And so it's finished, finalized. You remember, men came to Jesus one day in John 6, 28 and 29. They said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works, plural, of God? Jesus answered them and said to them this. He said, this is the work, singular. This is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise again from Almighty God. And then the last truth that we leave, and that is eternal commitment. You see, Jesus said, into your hands, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, Luke 23, 46. You see, God makes a commitment to you when you make a commitment to him. But you've got to be all in. All in. Now you remember that at one of the Passovers, Jesus attended. And he attended every single Passover. Jesus missed no Passover. The last Passover he attended was when he was crucified. He went to all of them. But in John 2, he went to a Passover. And as he was doing his miracles... John 2, 23 says, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Now watch this. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. You see, they believed, but they didn't really commit their lives. And so Jesus didn't commit to them because they weren't willing to commit. To, they believed, but they did not commit. I want to say something. Get this. Please get this. You can die believing, but not committed, and you'll be turned away. They believed. They saw the miracles. And the Bible says they believed, but Jesus did not commit to them. Wait a minute. It says they believed, but Jesus didn't commit to them. Why? Because he knew their hearts. Yeah, he must be Messiah. He must be the Christ. He must. Who can do these but God? Who can really do these miracles except God? So they believed, but they didn't commit. I find people who call themselves Christians who say they believe, but they've never committed they pop in every once in a while just to tip their head at God, but they're not committed. You ask them if they believe in God, oh yeah, but they're not committed. You ask them if they're a church member, oh yeah, but they're not committed. You ask them if they want to go to heaven when they die, oh yeah, but they're not committed. They stand and sing the hymns of the church but they're not committed. They go to the Sunday school class, but they're not committed. They go to the deacon meeting, but they're not committed. And sad to say there may be across pulpits in this country people who stand and preach, but they're not committed. Jesus said, I'm not committing to you. Because you're not committing to me. And all the lip service is not going to cut it. 
And just because you say you are a Christian doesn't make you one. Christians, born again, people are sold out, committed, leaning on nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Folks, what can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is that flow. Oh, that washes me. What? White as snow. Folks, commit to the one who committed to you. And when you do, heaven is your home. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for these truths. Oh, so many things we could say about the cross, and many things have been said. So today we just ask that you do a work that only you can do in the hearts and lives of these folks here. If there's someone here who has never committed, may today they be like the thief on the cross who said, oh, Lord, remember me. Remember me. In Jesus' name.